thank you so much for inviting me to give this talk on new therapies, uh, drugs, deliveries, and biologics for epilepsy, the expanding pipeline. I'm Jacqueline French. I'm a professor of neurology at NYU Epilepsy Center. Here are my disclosures. I work for a company, um, a nonprofit called the Epilepsy Study Consortium, which works with a number of companies that are trying to bring new therapies to the clinic. So I'm going to start out by looking at a little bit of history of what has happened in the past in terms of newly diagnosed patients when they start to uh, take medication to control their seizures, how do they do? So the first study looking at this was from 1982 to 1997. And you can see that when newly diagnosed patients were started on their first anti-seizure medicine, and it doesn't really matter which one it was, almost half of them became seizure-free. A smaller group became seizure-free with the second drug they tried, but if they failed the first and the second drug, then the third drug or combinations of drugs had much less likelihood of getting them seizure-free. And at the end of the day, about one-third of patients could not be controlled with any of the seizure medications they tried. The study was uh, repeated up until 2014, and you can see that there were a, a, a larger number of people that were being looked at. Uh, and between 1997 and 2014, which is more than 15 years, there were many drugs that had been approved onto the marketplace. And so now people could not only try a second drug, but a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, and then a seventh. But unfortunately, when the numbers were added up, they didn't really look any better in regards to the number of patients who were uncontrolled. It was still about a third. This was very disappointing. It was also a call to action in a certain way to say we need to develop better drugs that actually can make people seizure free. Uh, not that the, the drugs that were approved during that time didn't help people in a number of different ways, and it may have reduced their seizures. They, they may have been better tolerated. But what we're really looking for is obviously complete seizure freedom. Now, in the future, from 2014, even until the present day, have we made a dent? I hope that we have. And I hope that in the future, we continue to shrink that number of people who can't get control of their seizures. So in the current era, uh, people start therapy with a single drug. Uh, if that doesn't work, again, they may try another drug, what we call sequential uh, drug therapy, sequential monotherapy. If a single drug doesn't work, they can try combination therapies. And if those don't work, they fall into the group that we call drug-resistant epilepsy. Even at that point, they do have options such as surgery. We have the vagus nerve stimulator. We have laser ablation. We can cut out the area where the seizures begin if we know where that area is. Um, and we also have neurostimulation devices such as the responsive neurostimulator and the deep brain stimulator. <clears throat> People also can be treated with dietary therapy, such as the ketogenic diet or the modified Atkins diet. And all that time, they can continue to try different medications or they can be in clinical trials for new medications. And uh, there are many, many medications that people can try. This is a timeline. And you can see that up until about the year 2000, there were very few drugs available to treat epilepsy. And since then, there has been a really, really a ramp up of the number of drugs available, including the most recent ones, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about, sonobamate, ganaxolone, and fenfluramine. But despite all of these drugs being approved, uh, this is data looking at the patients who <clears throat> had treatment-resistant epilepsy, and went into clinical trials of these different uh, drugs that were approved. And you can see that um, even over the three months of the clinical trial, 
Very few of them, <clears throat> when these drugs were added on, were able to be seizure free. Um, here you can see 3% or 2% of the patients going in. That changed with the most recent drug that was approved, which was Sinobamate, where 18% of the patients that were in the trial became seizure free for the three months of the clinical trial. Well, it's all very well and good if they could be seizure free for three months, but what happened after that? We do have a little data to look at that. This is just one <clears throat> long-term follow-up study. It's from a single site, Johns Hopkins. They had 49 people who were started on Sinobamate in trials, and they followed those patients still on Sinobamate for three to eight years for an average of about five years each. And what they looked at is how much better they were at the end of the time they were on the drug than before they started the drug. And this is the reduction in seizures. Some of them got worse and probably uh, didn't stay on the drug. And then there were those that got better. And each of these lines represents a single person. So you can see this is the 50% line that um, the majority of people actually at the end of the study were uh, had more than half of their seizures reduced. And you can see this is 80% of their seizures reduced, 90% of their seizures reduced. And here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people out of the 49 who had all of their seizures eliminated over the long term by this drug Sinobamate. So it does look like it has the potential to get people who were not seizure free and uh, failed many of the previous medications to be seizure free. So the good of Sinobamate is that it can offer seizure freedom. It can have some problems with side effects when you go up to higher doses, but at the lower doses, it's actually pretty well tolerated. There is some bad news, and that is that in the early days of clinical trials, some of the volunteers and the early patients in trials got a very serious rash and also a condition called DRESS, which stands for drug rash with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms, which can be very, very serious. Because of that, they realized that they needed to expose the, the, uh, the body much, much slower to the drug. So they started to require a very slow ramp up or what we call a titration. And it actually now takes eight weeks to slowly ramp the drug up to where it has its effect. But once they did that, actually they have seen no additional cases of the rash or uh, this dress syndrome. So since the drug was approved several years ago by the FDA, um, there have been no cases of, of rash or dress. Now, hopefully this is just one of a number of new drugs that will be able to get people who have not been able to get seizure free, seizure free. And the next one I'm gonna talk about is not available on the market yet as Sinobamate is. It's still in clinical trials and there's still only been one trial that's been done. Um, and this is a drug called Xenon 1101. It works instead of uh, most of our drugs, uh, including Dilantin, Integritol, and several others, work on sodium channels. This one works on potassium channels. Um, you can see the results in a trial. So in the clinical trial, people were randomly by chance allotted to four different groups. One was placebo, which is a sugar pill, and then three different doses of the medication. 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, or 25 milligrams. And each of these, uh, the dose was added on to drugs that people were already taking. And you can see the uh, number of people here, the percent of people who were responders. And what do we mean by responders? Responders are people who had uh, more than half of their seizures eliminated by the drug. And you can see that at the low dose, a quarter, um, at the medium dose, about 43%, and over half of the people at the high dose of 25 milligrams, 
had a half or more of their seizures eliminated. Um, but really what we're talking about here is can the drug eliminate all seizures and make you seizure free? And after this study was over, there was a long-term open label period where everybody got the drug. And in that period, 10% uh, of the people in the trial achieved seizure freedom for 12 months or more, and 17% achieved seizure freedom for six months or more. So this does indicate that this is another drug that will take some of those people in that one third who couldn't get seizure free and make them seizure free. This was a study in focal epilepsy. And by the way, I should mention that this drug does not need a slow ramp up. It can be started at the, the effective dose and it, it only requires once a day dosing. Uh, this study now is being followed by a second study to confirm the results. And also um, a study in, this is for focal epilepsy, a study is starting in generalized epilepsy. There are other drugs also being trialed for focal and generalized epilepsy. Um, there's a drug called Darigabat. It's currently in trials. The trial has not completed yet, so I can't tell you whether it was as effective. It works uh, the same way that benzodiazepine, uh, benzodiazepines work on the same receptor in the brain. That's like Valium, Lorazepam, Diazepam, uh, Clobazam. Uh, all of these are very effective drugs, but they make people very sleepy. But this one does not make people sleepy. There's another drug that works uh, on sodium channels. Again, the way Dilantin, Integritol, and some other very well-known drugs work. But it has um, less side effects and less effect on the liver than those drugs and might be very good for people with newly diagnosed epilepsy. And then there's another drug, Biohaven 7000, um, that is, uh, they are performing trials in both focal and generalized uh, epilepsy. Uh, this drug works very similarly to the one I just showed you the results for, Xenon 1101, um, but may be better tolerated, but we'll have to see in the clinical trials. Now I'm gonna uh, change uh, a little bit um, to a different type of drug. Uh, so I just showed you a number of drugs that work for the common, what we call the common epilepsies. The common epilepsies are focal epilepsies that come from one seizure focus in the brain, like temporal lobe epilepsy, frontal lobe epilepsy, et cetera, as well as another uh, group of epilepsies, which we call idiopathic generalized epilepsies. You may remember, uh, you may have heard some of the names of these syndromes, such as juvenile myoclonic epilepsy um, and absence epilepsy. Um, and uh, those two syndromes together account for three quarters of all people with epilepsy. But then there are other people, particularly children, who don't have these common epilepsies. They have what we call rare forms of epilepsy for which there really are no good treatments. And these rare epilepsies tend to be lifelong. They tend to start very early in childhood and they tend to be associated with um, a develop, what we call a developmental and epileptic encephalopathy, which means that the children have developmental delays in addition to their epilepsy. Now, uh, uh, many of these, not all by any means, but a number of them are the results of a single gene that has a mutation in it. And this gives us an opportunity to modify those diseases with genetic or gene-based therapies. So um, this just shows you that as of 2015, going up to about here, most of the drugs that were in development were for non-rare diseases. The rare diseases are also called orphan diseases. Whereas after 2015, all of these drugs here were in development for rare or often disease, orphan diseases. So you can see that there was a whole shift <clears throat> from a focus 
on the common epilepsies to a focus on the rare epilepsies. So there have been drugs that were recently approved for orphan or rare syndromes, including um, Epidiolex or Cannabidiol, which, which was approved for Dravé, lennox gasto and seizures associated with tuberous sclerosis. Fenformine or Fintepla, which was approved for Dravé and lennox gasto syndrome. These are some of the names of the rare epilepsies. Um, Everolimus or Afinitor was uh, approved for seizures associated with tuberous sclerosis. <laughs> and recently, Ganaxalone or Zetalmi was approved for an epilepsy called CDKL5 deficiency disorder, which is a result of a mutation <clears throat> in the CDKL5 gene. So I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about fenfluramine. Um, the fenfluramine was first marketed, and some of you may remember this, as an appetite suppressant, uh, but it was combined with another drug called fentermine. And the combination of fenfluramine and fentermine was marketed as fenfen. <clears throat> and uh, that, that combination of fenfen was very, very popular for weight loss until 1997, when it was removed from the market because it was found that there were serious problems happening in the lungs, something called pulmonary stenosis, where there was thickening of the lungs as well as thickening of the valves in the heart. But even when it was uh, uh, out there in the 1990s, fenfluramine alone was being used to treat difficult seizures. And because of that, um, a company uh, decided to test it much, much later in uh, these difficult to treat uh, what we call rare or orphan epilepsies called Dravet syndrome and uh, lennox gasto syndrome. Uh, so this is uh, a trial that was done in Dravet syndrome. Again, a severe rare epilepsy of childhood, predominantly of childhood. Uh, and what this shows you is what happened to the kids that were had sugar pill added, which is the blue bars, versus those who had a low dose of 0.2 milligrams, which is the orange bars, um, or 0.7 milligrams, which is the gray bars. Um, and there was one trial that used 0.4 milligrams. And you can see when this drug was added on, and this is the uh, percent reduction in seizures. And you can see that placebo was not very effective or sugar pill, as you might um as you might expect, whereas uh, the fenfluramine um, caused uh, somewhere between a 60, you know, a 40 to 60 or 70 percent reduction, depending on the dose, which was way, way, way better than any of the drugs that came before. It also has some side effects. Not surprisingly, um, it does decrease the appetite, and that's related to the dose that's given. Um, there's some diarrhea. There's um, some sleepiness. Somnolence is sleepiness. Uh, however, so far, they have not had to stop the drug in, in children because of heart problems or lung problems. This is given again without the fentermine and at a much lower dose than was given in the fen fen combination. And so far, there hasn't been any cardiovascular disease or uh, problems with the lungs in long term follow up. So it's looking very, very promising. And it has been extremely helpful for these young children with a very, very serious disease. Um, going on to Ganaxalone, again, another drug that was just approved. Um, this is for a very, very rare, um, what we call X-linked genetic severe epilepsy. It only happens in one in 40,000 live births. And here again, you can see the placebo or sugar pill compared to Ganaxalone, um, and you can see that ganaxalone caused about one third of the seizures to be reduced by about one third on average. 
uh, compared to placebo, which had a much lower likelihood of reducing seizures. There are many other drugs that are in development right now for orphan syndromes, and you can see them here. So we hope that these uh, rare and severe syndromes are going to have better therapies. Again, I'm going to change tax a little bit and talk about rescue therapies and development. So what's a rescue therapy? It's a treatment that's not given every day, but can be used to stop a cluster of seizures or sometimes treat when the risk of a seizure is higher. Like if you always know that you have a seizure when you have a fever, maybe you can take this rescue therapy before that seizure happens and prevent it. Seizure clustering, seizures ha that happen in bunches, is common in people with treatment-resistant epilepsy. And if people know that seizures are going to happen in a cluster, then why not try and prevent them? So we prescribe a lot of rescue therapies, uh, and we think that they're very useful when we can't get all the seizures controlled by other means. So we have new rescue therapies on the market that have been approved in the last few years. Uh, they're much easier to take than the old rescue therapies that sometimes had to be given rectally. Now we have those that can be given uh, by squirting the medication in the nose, such as midazolam and diazepam, nasolam and valtoco. And we also have one that can be put um, against the, the inside of the lip called uh, clobazam or sympazam. But all of those, um, when you give them, will only prevent the next seizure, but they don't work fast enough to present, prevent the seizure that you are currently having. So that's the dream. That's the goal to sort of have an EpiPen for seizures that when you're having a seizure, you could use this rescue therapy and stop that seizure. And we may have something. This is, again, something that's in development. It is called staccato alprazolam, and it's an inhalation device. Like, you know, people can use an inhalation device for asthma, for example, and what it does is when you take a, a just a normal breath, what you can see is the normal breath heats up the inside of the device and turns the drug that's on a sheet inside the device into a gas and you inhale it into your lungs. So it's easy to use. Um, people can even uh, use it when they're having a seizure because a loved one or a companion can put it up to their mouth and they just have to take a normal breath. Um, and it is currently in clinical trials for rapid cessation of a long seizure or a cluster of seizures. Now I'm going to talk about, I've been talking up until this point about what we call anti-seizure medicines and the International League Against Epilepsy has actually changed the name of what we used to call anti-epileptic drugs. We now call them anti-seizure medicines because this is highlighting that most of the medications that we use don't alter the course of epilepsy. They are symptomatic therapy. They treat the seizure. They don't treat the underlying epilepsy. So what does this mean? Look at this little man here. Let's say he has pneumonia. We can either treat his pneumonia, let's say with an antibiotic, which would get rid of the pneumonia, or we could treat his cough. And that's basically what we're doing with an anti-seizure medicine is we're treating the symptom, but you have to, as you know, continue to take that medication for a very long time because the underlying disease is still there. So is it even possible to imagine that we could have a drug that was anti-epileptic, which means it actually gets rid of the underlying problem. So I showed you this uh, before, uh, what we could do for drug-resistant epilepsy. And we're hoping that in the future, we add another bubble of what we call disease-modifying drugs that would actually treat the underlying epilepsy. And the first place that people look to in order to modify epilepsy, as I said before, is genes. Because the more that we know about genes, which are the building blocks of 
of our body and our systems. Um, there's sort of the roadmap by which um, your body is created. And if there is a, uh, a problem with one of those genes, then things go awry. And if the problem is in a gene that uh, decides how your brain gets built, then your brain is going to have a problem. And one of those problems could be epilepsy. So these are all genes, and I'm sorry that this is so small, but these are all genes that have been uh, discovered since uh, 2009 that can cause epilepsy if they have a mutation or an error in the gene. So our genes contain information for making specific proteins, and often the proteins that these genes make are essential for proper brain function. If people are born with errors or mutations in those genes, either abnormal proteins are made or no protein at all is made. And that can lead to severe brain function, dysfunction, seizures, autism, and other issues. So now we can try approaches to replace the gene or fix the bad protein. So for example, uh, there is a drug that is currently in clinical trials called STK001 or STOK001. It is an, um, in a class of medications called antisense oligonucleotides that have to be given through, um, they have to be put in the spinal fluid, which means an injection into the back, into the spinal fluid. But once that injection it is in, uh, the effect can last for several months as opposed to taking a pill every day. Um, and in this case, um, what it is doing is um, in the case of a gene mutation, um, you again need to make an essential protein in your brain. And before treatment, you may not be able to make that protein um, in enough quantity in order to have normal brain function. And what this drug does is it goes into the brain and it stokes, that's why STK, stoke, it stokes the ability of that um, uh, DNA to make the proper protein and therefore to replace it and return to a somewhat normal brain function. There is another company called Encoded that's doing gene therapy where a one-time infusion, this is not every few months, but just once, delivery of a transporter that comes from a virus. The virus is a safe virus and it delivers instructions to the brain to increase the activity of, the, of that gene that is you know, now not creating the proper protein. And hopefully again, once those uh, viral particles insert themselves in the proper way, the brain can continue to make the proper protein from that point all the way into the future. So you're basically correcting what's wrong in the brain in order to make the proper protein and for the brain to correct itself. And there is another approach, which is again, um, an epilepsy treatment as opposed to a treatment, a seizure treatment. Um, again, at the present time, we have to give medication every day because they're only symptomatic treatments. But what if we could make a factory inside the brain that continually produced that medication and you didn't have to take it by mouth every day? Well, that's sort of the idea of cell therapy. Um, so we have... <clears throat> Um, things called uh, excitation, which is a ramp up of activity in the brain and inhibition, which is sort of a cooling down of things in the brain. That's why I have like the little red man and the little blue man. Um, if you can reduce excitation and increase inhibition, that will stop a seizure. On the other hand, if you increase excitation or reduce inhibition, then a seizure will happen. So if we can pump up this inhibition in the brain, we might be able to stop seizures. So how do you do that? Well, um, there are uh, cells that 
um, can turn into anything in the body. They're called stem cells. They can be made to grow into different types of cells. And in the lab, they can be turned into cells that produce inhibition or, you know, sort of ramp down the brain. Um, and then those can be implanted into the area of the brain that is producing seizures. If they are implanted into the brain, they live there permanently and become a factory of inhibition that restores the excitatory inhibitory balance. And Nerona is a company that's doing a trial in people with seizures from the temporal lobe, which is one area of the brain, where they are implanting these inhibitory stem, stem cells into the brain. And so far, two people have had these uh, implanted into their brain, and it does take an operation to do it. But these two people have had 90 to 100% reduction in their seizures. Uh, the first person is coming up upon one year since the cells were implanted. Uh, and it has made a profound difference in the number of seizures that uh, he is having. So uh, the intent is to do a clinical trial and implant more people with these stem cells and see whether this can be a permanent improvement in their situation. So in conclusion, this is definitely an exciting time full of innovation. Disease modifying therapies, I believe, are right around the corner. Um, and I, I can't stop without saying that if people do have treatment resistant epilepsy, that is the drugs that they have tried have not worked for them, they can certainly help out by volunteering as uh, to be part of these clinical trials. And as you can see, many of the people who were in these clinical trials had substantial benefit from them. Uh, people are, are watched very closely. And if you have any questions about volunteering for a clinical trial, please don't hesitate to ask me. Thank you so much for your attention.